It's 25 years since I made The Shock of the New, a set of eight visual essays on the relationship of painting, sculpture, and architecture to some of the great cultural issues of the last hundred years. A personal view of modern art in the 20th century. I was trying to tell the story of how art has always attempted to stay one step ahead of the game, defining who we were, what it meant to live in the time in which we lived, and what the future, however bold and however shocking it could be, might hold. But now, with the 20th century over, and living in a culture where anything and everything goes, I think it's a good moment to reassess at least some of the claims of modern art, and add a final chapter examining what you could say was good and what was bad, and why it's important to know the difference. Today, newness in art doesn't seem to matter so much because it's expected, it's museum policy, it's routine. Maybe the shock of the news simply doesn't matter anymore. But in that case, it's become all the more important to decide for yourself whether a work of art is just a little feat of novelty or whether it actually has something fresh and vital to say. Just over a hundred years ago, the world was amazed by the sight of the Eiffel Tower peering strangely above the skyline of Paris. Wherever you went in the city, you couldn't escape the sight of the tower. It was visible from everywhere. This was the master image of the age, the structure that seemed to express the energy, the confidence, and the self-belief that art could offer. And the important thing was that it had a mass audience, Millions of people, residents and visitors, were touched by the feeling of a new age that the tower made real. Eighty years later, when the Twin Towers went up in the 1970s New York, people didn't think the same way about that. 40,000 square feet of office space confirmed that business was good, and that Lower Manhattan was steadily usurping the square mile in London as the centre of the world's financial markets. It said something else too, but which we took for granted. In their gross confidence, the Twin Towers were an emblem of a society content with itself and with the world and seemingly unassailable. So nothing on September 10th, 2001, could have prepared us for those hijacked planes heading toward the World Trade Center on the following morning and the shock of its collapse. I saw it from the window of my loft, the great unfurling disintegration, the toppling, the unbelievable quality of catastrophe. Replayed a million times, the fall of the towers has become one of the iconic images of the 20th century. To anyone with a biblical background, it also suggests the fall of the Tower of Babel. I guess we're all apt to generalize, but it's not hard to see the erection of the Eiffel Tower as the beginning of a modern age and the death of the Twin Towers as its terrible end. The fall of the World Trade Center immediately entered that small stock of images by which we remember the horror and cruelty and violence of the 20th century. The atomic bomb, the death camps at the end of the Second World War, the assassination of JFK. Thinking of these events, I sometimes wonder why so few of them have been depicted by contemporary artists. And I try to imagine what the great painters of the past might have made of them. How would Turner have painted the mushroom cloud? How would Goya have depicted the liberation of Belson? 
or David shown the assassination of Kennedy. There was a time when art had a lot to say about the world and its events. As recently as 1937, after all, Picasso had been able to paint the most powerful invective against violence in modern art, Guernica. It was inspired by an act of war, the bombing of a Basque town during the Spanish Civil War by German aircraft at the request of the Spanish nationalist commander, General Emilio Mola. Guernica may not have been the last great history painting, but it was surely the last modern painting of major importance that took its subject from politics with the intention of changing the way that large numbers of people thought and felt about power. A reproduction of it was given to the United Nations and hung in its foyer in New York to remind everyone of the horrors of war. But we're a long way from the moral shock of that now. In January 2003, when Colin Powell came to the United Nations to argue the case for war in Iraq, Guernica was discreetly covered with a blue curtain. We don't do art like this anymore. And today, the most controversial works of art do not tell so much of the horrors of war, but of the artist's own personal phobias. You only have to go to a big survey show of contemporary art, like the Whitney Biennial in New York, to see that it's all become rather bloated. Artists seeking to make an impact with an instant hit, anything to stand out from the crowd, anything that says, look, here I am, I have arrived, I am different. Whatever it is, it's about making an immediate impact, about fast, gettable, and sellable images. Shit, man, this is what they used to do in Notting Hill Gate in 1964. The trouble is, you know, if you live long enough and you're in a culture of revivals, in the end nothing is new. It's as though Western art began with Andy Warhol. In this atmosphere, artists are treated like stars. Social glamour is the criterion for star quality. Andy Warhol did more than any other artist to turn the art world into the art business. Although his late work descended into feeble, repetitious kitsch, the main message of his career came through very loud and very clear. And it was that the primary model of art was fashion. His paintings, tremendously stylish in their rough silk screening, mimicked the dissociation of gaze and empathy induced by the mass media. The banal punch of tabloid newsprint, the visual jabber and the bright sleazy colours of TV, the sense of glut and anaesthesia caused by both. Two Elvises are better than one, and one Marilyn, patched like a gaudy stamp on a ground of gold leaf, could become a sly and grotesque parody of the Virgin Mary fixations of Warhol's own Catholic childhood, of the pretentious enlargement of media stars by a secular culture, and of the similarities between both. I want to be a machine, said Andy. Well, he didn't quite succeed in this high ambition, probably no artist can, but he did leave this strange legacy whereby artists who came after him engaged obsessively in the production of serial novelties. Today, the closest thing to Warhol's factory with its army of assistants is the studio of Jeff Koons. 
I wanted to meet Coons because he is probably the most famous living artist in America. Born in Philadelphia in 1955, Coons started very young by rearranging the items in the window of his father's shop. He financed his art by earning money as a commodity trader on the New York Stock Exchange and began his artistic career by putting consumer items in plexiglass boxes. Anything from vacuum cleaners to basketballs. A trick he'd learnt from Marcel Duchamp, an artist who made his name with ready-made sculpture in the teens and twenties of the last century. In the mid-1980s, Coons concentrated on reproducing stainless steel model trains that had once contained Jim Beam whiskey. He dabbled in a laundered and winsome kind of pornography after his marriage to the Italian politician and porn star Cicciolina with a series called Made in Heaven. He then duplicated advertising images of luxury goods, directing his assistants to paint exact replicas for a purpose that I've never really been able to fathom. Like Warhol, he hooks onto the ad mass imagery of an age and tries to turn it into iconography. His statues of subjects like the Pink Panther are kitchified into porcelain like in large souvenirs. He uses the same technique with religion, such as this copy from Leonardo, a statue of John the Baptist, as though his work and Leonardo's were in some sense one and the same. Religion has diminished into celebrity, a kind of reverse apotheosis made most clearly in his sculpture of Michael Jackson and his pet monkey, Bubbles. I saw uh, Michael at the time as somebody that uh, really would do anything for his art, uh, somebody that was just transforming himself. He wanted a large audience. And at the same time, the, the public seemed so hungry for this too. You know, Michael really was a, a symbol of the kind of the celebrity culture and everything that we look to that culture for. I mean, this deals with uh, kind of this Christ-like quality of, you know, of putting somebody in this type of uh, situation. Uh, but um, well, here he is saving the soul of this little ape. <laughs> well, I think it has to do with uh, a sense of uh, evolution and a sense of eternity. But I think there's, there's tragedy in this piece, and I think the tragedy was always there. There was tragedy in what Michael was doing to himself. Uh, there was always this, this tragedy of how culture looks to uh, the celebrity. I was really thinking about Renaissance sculpture. I was thinking about the Vatican and how the Vatican's used art, and this is within that tradition. But I was thinking of uh, Michelangelo uh. and uh, the Pieta. Kunz's act, which is not perhaps even an act, is to believe that he is a natural descendant of the great artists of the past, interpreting religious iconography with a kind of contemporary twist, but aspiring to the same level of eternal fame and truth. Perhaps if you mention your name in the same sentence as Michelangelo's, people will begin to see you in the same light. And if you then go to Italy and hire lots of craftsmen to work for you, using the same materials, then you can start taking yourself even more seriously. I saw Masaccio's expulsion, and that was really kind of the, the genesis of uh, the Made in Heaven work. Uh, I was really moved by the expulsion, and I guess uh, I felt... But the expulsion is a deeply pessimistic, even tragic image. I mean, here are these people, Adam and Eve, who have just lost everything. They've lost all their sources of happiness. They're being thrown out. Uh, what relation does that have to yours? Well, but humankind. I mean, we're in that state since that moment, and uh, to deal with that uh, state. And so uh, people have uh, guilt and shame, and uh, my work has dealt with guilt and shame for a long time. Sex is a fairly common theme in Kunz's work. Sometimes it's moderately subtle, sometimes it's quite explicit, and at other times it's rather confusing. A woman in a bath with the top of her head cut off, surprised by an underwater diver with a snorkel. I tried to relate that cultural guilt and shame 
to guilt and shame that people have about masturbation. And most young children come in contact with their bodies when they take a bath. And do both of these come together in this girl as a masturbation image and in covering her breasts? Well, uh, it's kind of different. I mean, the sense of the bathtubs there, uh, the guilt and shame is, I think, that the viewer feels too, because I think you want to participate, the viewer, in the victimization that's happening here. I mean, she's startled, she's trying to protect herself, but yet, you know, this finish here, it's so sensitive. I mean, I want to touch the hands, mm -hmm. I, I want to touch her arm. And uh, so it has that sense of quality that uh, the medium, kind of this victim victimizer uh, role that's taking place here. Mm -hmm. But the uh, voyeur or interferer or whatever he is actually is also cut off, isn't he? I mean, there's no way that he could fit in there. That's correct. You know, I guess maybe this is us uh, that's, you know, underneath there in the snorkel. Today, Coombs and his assistants are working on a series of large children's toys, playing with materials, inflating dogs and lobsters, and then recasting them in aluminium so that they acquire weight and a sort of gravitas. Nobody questions the work because Coons's lock on the market is so thorough. His woman in a tub sold for 1.7 million, the Pink Panther for 1.8 million dollars, the train of whiskey bottles for 5 million. Over the last 25 years, I've been amazed at the rise in prices and the sheer volume of the art market. A hundred million dollars for a Picasso removes the work from public currency. It says, look, I can belong only to the super rich and all other Picassos are just the same. This alienation of the work from the common viewer is actually a form of spiritual vandalism, a cultural obscenity. What on earth is going on? Theo Westreich runs an advisory service for collectors, assessing value amidst the hype and telling you, the neophyte, who is hot, who is not, and why art has become such a popular investment for collectors. The reality of collecting, the desire to own, the desire to behold, the desire to learn, the desire to have, never changed. We have an enormously rich history of collecting. What's different now is that the nature of collecting has changed only because there are more people who can play in the market. Why do they want to? Sexy. It's fun. It's engaging. It's fast-paced. It's opportunistic. It's about your culture and your time. You understand it. You can embrace it. It confers value on you, the collector, to have objects that other people perceive as important, valuable, critical. Art does not need to make an immediate impact to have value. It could be troubling and yet still bear repeated viewings. And you can find this slow disclosure in the work of Paula Rago, an artist who is psychically tense without being melodramatic. I think she's the best painter of women's experience alive today. Her paintings contain narratives that don't always show themselves at once. The work is subtle, puzzling, discreet, and undermining. Things are not always explicit. Things are not always what they seem. Paula Rago tells stories, fairy tales, fables, plays, parables, and the folklore with which she grew up. But it's a psychic narrative, laced with stories from the confessional, the psychiatrist's couch, and her own bad dreams. I think that all paintings, ever since they began to be paintings, were about 
stories. All stories give an explanation for the world. They all give um, a face, they all make sense of the world. They all make, in their way, they make sense of the world. And the violence in the world, which there is plenty of, you see also in the folk tales. So it makes sense of the world. It condenses it and gives it a form and makes it much more acceptable to, to see. Rago's paintings draw on memories of her childhood, a world of dark secrets, compromise and betrayal, a murky mythology in which the public and the private interweave in love and family life. Paula Rago is not that interested in what Americans call family values, but she's fascinated by the truth of families as a source of conflict. When there are two people or more in a Rago, you can be quite sure that something rather bad is going to happen to at least one of them. You very often seem to deal with childhood memories that you find repulsive and then you work through them. Yes. Has painting always been a means towards doing that? It's always been a means of doing things I couldn't do any other way. So you can do things in pictures that you can't do in life ever. Her childhood in Portugal was coloured by growing up under a military dictatorship. A work such as this, The Interrogator's Garden, shows a guilt-free fascist in rubber gardening gloves, a torturer, perhaps a rapist, a man confident of his own unassailable position in a society gone wrong that demeans women, bans dissent and outlaws free speech. Her painting, The Policeman's Daughter, brings home the ruthlessness of a world where childhood is compromised and made sexual. The policeman's daughter. Yeah. This picture of a girl lovingly shining her father's jackboot, one of the main symbols of oppressive authority of the 20th century, clearly has a very great political resonance for you. Her devotion to her father is not necessarily political, although she is certainly a very obedient girl and likes to do what her father asks her. I think it's more that kind. If that is political, then it is political. But it has to do with obedience and being very well brought up. But the policeman's daughter also seems to me to carry a very powerful image of incest too. Probably. Only probably? I mean, it wasn't intentioned at the time. I mean, I didn't think, oh, this is incest, but, but I think probably yes. My daughter who was posing for me, she was wiping, and I said, darling, just ram your fist down the boot. Ah. Right? And that's how it happened. Mm -hmm. I just told her, just ram your fist down there. And she did. And like a worked. good daughter. Like a good daughter, yeah. I mean, I mean, she was, she was okay, you know, she was, she, so it worked. <laughs> These are ambitious pictures, deeply engaged with the relationships people have with each other, with their imagination, and with their pasts. Has there ever been a time when you didn't think of your art in terms of a wider kind of social address? Well, I never do think of it as a wide kind of social address. Yeah, but you're not a simple painter who paints, say, still lives. No, no, I don't know how to do, no, no. You, you're always I can't painting see the human point. situations. Yes, yes, I am. A fight, a power play, power play. Power. Who, who, who bullies whom and, and all this, and the injustices, injustices that go on. I mean, there's a whole series I did on, on abortion pictures, for instance, which were political pictures with a message, you know, straightforward message. And they were done because I, I wanted to do something about it, you see. 
In Portugal, abortion is still a crime, and these images show the consequences of people seeking backstreet abortions. The images are not sensational for sensation's sake. They're real and have a haunting impact. Rago's art makes it very clear that painting, in order to be contemporary, does not need to be about glitz or surface or media references, and that painting can actually have something to say, even though that something may not be immediately agreeable. Some of the most moving art that deals with this tension between private conscience and public responsibility has emerged from Germany. I decided to go to Berlin because it's this city that has most embodied the troubled nature of the 20th century. The oscillation between decadence and social collapse, two world wars, the Holocaust, the forced acceptance but the eventual rejection of communism, the fall of the Berlin Wall, a city soaked in the drama and chaos of history. But should the artist deal with such a history? How much should be remembered and how much cast aside? Should he or she forget it all as though nothing had happened, as if that were possible? Or should he confront questions of memory, identity and nationality and test the moral imagination, his own and others? The artist Anselm Kiefer has had the courage and perhaps even the looniness to tackle it head on. In 1969, he produced the first of his books some of which show him repeatedly giving the Nazi salute. He wanted to understand both the attractive and the corrosive nature of power. Kiefer probes deeply into the roots of German history and identity. His ambition ranges across myth and history and fiction from the legend of Parseval to the architecture of Albert Speer. This painting is called Monument to an Unknown Artist, but of course the unknown artist is Hitler. Kiefer's work covers an enormous terrain of cultural reference and pictorial techniques, and in the process he's tried to shoulder the content of tragic history and redemptive hope that so much recent art has tended either to trivialize or ignore. His use of materials gives his work power and resonance, whether it's names and numbers on bits of paper, or toy aeroplanes, or children's clothes. And these come together in a series of pictures that commemorate the most infamous event in German history, the Holocaust. Twenty years ago, Anselm Kiefer was attacked by some Germans as a neo-Nazi. On the other hand, the State of Israel has honoured him for his depictions of the Holocaust. The most humanly poignant cluster of images in his work is based upon a poem by Paul Celan, who wrote it in a concentration camp, and it's called Death Fugue. Death is a master from Germany. His eye is blue, he strikes you with leaden bullets. His aim is true. A man lives in the house, your golden hair, Margareta. He sets his hounds upon us. He grants us a grave in the air. He plays with the serpents and dreams. Death is a master from Germany. Your golden hair, Margareta, 
your ashen hair, Shulamit. Margareta, the blonde personification of ideal German womanhood, and Shulamit, the cremated Jewess who is also the archetypal beloved of the Song of Solomon, interweave in Kiefer's work in a haunting and oblique way. Neither is actually seen as a figure. Margareta's presence, like a motif in music, is signalled by long wisps of golden straw, while Shulamit's emblem is charred substance and black shadow. What can I remember? What should I remember? These questions run through Kiefer's work from the very beginning. His art sets itself against the sterile irony and the sense of trivial pursuit that infest our culture. It affirms the moral imagination. Today, history is hard to keep in mind as we struggle to keep up with the barrage of information that assails us. We are now exposed to more images in a day than anyone in the 14th century would have known in a lifetime. We're surrounded by the fuzz and rumble of endless imagery, the white noise of everyday life, signals of information and desire that blur into each other, punctuated only by the bright highlights and sudden shouts of images that cut through the chaos. Most of it is garbage. Most of it needs excising, even if we're fearful that we might be missing something. We're probably not. We have to discard. We have to throw things away, cleanse the doors of our perception and work out what is worth looking at, what is worth remembering, what are the images that matter, what will we retain. An artist who knows the contemporary world, but also seems to know what to filter out of it, an artist who has been radical by turning away from the chaos to pursue the beautiful, is David Hockney. Fashionable and glamorous in the 70s and 80s, Hockney was, in a sense, but only in a sense, England's answer to Andy Warhol. With sun, sex and swimming pools, it was clear from the start that Hockney would have made a contemporary illustrator of genius. But he was much more than that. With his wiry line that defined shape while subliminally conveying its depth and weight, with his unfailing instinct for placement, he knew just where the metallic fronds of a palm should pop up in paint. And just how effective the restrained simplicity of a blue pool, a pink building, a blue sky, and a splash of water could evoke an endless summer afternoon. A bigger splash remains the quintessential Los Angeles painting. The splash itself, in its strands, hatchings, and squiggles of white, is a masterpiece of stylization. It shows how even beauty can be radical. Then Hockney turned to photography. Distrusting the single image stare of the camera lens, he took to fragmenting each scene or motif by taking hundreds of images of it and then constructing a semi-cubist patchwork out of these shifting, overlapping views. It was an attempt to put time back into photography, the darting look of the painter's eye. In the end, I'm not sure that this was the best part of his work. In any case, now he's turned 180 degrees and he's come out the other side, returning to drawing and painting and creating some of the simplest and most restrained images of his career.
You can see how far he's travelled back by looking at images of his mother in paint, in photography, and then in simple brush and wash. Today he's working in watercolours, painting directly without prior underdrawing, with as few brush strokes as possible. Elegance, simplicity, restraint, whether it be summer rain or the garden outside his studio or a sketchbook of recent work in southern Spain. Let's have a look at some of these landscapes you've been working on. This is the sketchbook, you st one of the sketchbooks you start from, is it? I went to uh, Andalusia. Uh, oh, there we are, we're in Cordoba. Cordoba. Yeah, that's the great mosque in Cordoba. Yeah. Looks like an orchard, doesn't it? Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, palm grove, fabulous yes. palm grove. I thought yeah. it was incredibly beautiful. Courtyards in Seville. Right. Uh, beginning to see the patterns. Uh, yes. That happened. Uh, this is then at the Alhambra, this is the Charles V's palace. Oh, right, yes. The, uh, Are you moving directly with the brush or, or do you use any, I don't see any pencil under drawing, no, for instance. Brush. No, just brush. No, just brush. No, okay. pencil, yeah. Mm. I just used a brush. I just yes. had a big brush. There, the first thing I draw are these lines. Yeah. yeah. So that what you'd see is your early on are just grey lines. You're simplifying, you're making, how do I make the space? But I deliberately, as I said, just took a big brush, uh, four colours, and you start seeing. I didn't want to look through a camera. I looked through cameras for a long time. You did? Yeah. Yes, I did. And in the end, you're more aware of what's at the edges, what's, mm -hmm. what's not there. Mm -hmm. It's forced to be a certain kind of picture. I mean, that's Cordoba. Uh, yeah. I, thought, I thought it was unphotographable, actually, in a way. Well, you're pretty much right. I know I've tried to photograph that in my amateurish way, and it just comes out looking like a mess. Yeah. Also, when you're there, you notice the marvellous patterns that photography doesn't quite show you the mm -hmm. way you see them. Mm -hmm. Your eye sees the way different surfaces yes. have these patterns on. You don't get the thrill of this magnificent ceiling that's like, Ooh. yeah, it's like walking under a fantastic palm grove, isn't it? Yeah. It is. This kind of drawing is a feat of memory and concentration of keeping the eye alive, of retaining curiosity. Now, Hockney's returning to East Yorkshire to look again at the landscape of his childhood. And I worked on the land in East Yorkshire, oh, 50 years ago. Yeah. Harvesting. On the oh, East. really? Oh, yeah. From school. Oh, my God, you're the little boy in the corner of the constable. Yes, I was stooping <laughs> corn. I was stooping corn. I was in Yorkshire driving from Bridlington to Weatherby all the time mm. and I got fascinated. There's no hedges. It's big like the Western United States. Mm -hmm. You can see a long Just way. Just goes on forever. You can see a long, long mm. way. I might be using memory from 10 minutes past, but I'm also using memory from 50 years past. Yep. You paint it. You pick up big brushes. You paint it. I can now do that with incredible confidence. Mm. That oh, you should be able to. You were oh, yes. born there, you brought yeah, yeah, up yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah. But you do it in painting. Yeah. You cannot photograph this. Yes. It's not the same. Uh, it has to be painted. Fascinating. Well, there you go, David. You've got your work cut out once yes, again. Yes, I have. I have a big project. I have, I have a big project coming up, and I'm looking forward yeah, to it. Yeah, you've always got a big project yeah, coming I up. Yeah. Uh, it's called The World, mate. Yes. <laughs> In the 45 years that I've been writing about art, there's been a tragic depreciation in the traditional skills of painting and drawing. 
the nuts and bolts of the profession. In part, it's been caused by the assumption that photography and its cognate media, film and television, tell the most truth about the visual. This is not true. The camera, if it's lucky, may tell a different truth to drawing, but not necessarily a truer one. Painting and drawing bring us into a different, a deeper and more fully experienced relation to the object. We have had a gutful of fast art and fast food. What we need more of is slow art, art that holds time as a vase holds water. Art that grows out of modes of perception and making whose skill and doggedness make you think and feel. Art that isn't merely sensational, that doesn't get its message across in 10 seconds, that isn't falsely iconic, that hooks onto something deep running in our natures. In a word, art that is the very opposite of mass media. Lucy and Freud's world is made of paint, thick, crusty paint that asserts with the utmost clarity the advantages of looking over theatre. I don't think there's an artist alive, and there hasn't been one since Picasso, who made the scrutiny of the naked human body such an unsettling business. The way Freud perceives a form and builds it up from oily mud on a piece of cloth, the way that he constructs analysed equivalence to reality, is inspiring. The show at the Wallace Collection by this famously reclusive artist represented an order of experience quite different from the relatively weightless coming into sight of a photographic image or a silkscreen. Every inch of the surface has to be won, must be argued through, bears the traces of curiosity and inquisition, and above all takes nothing for granted and demands active engagement with the viewer as its right. Little or nothing of this kind happens with Warhol or Gilbert and George or any of the other image scavengers and recyclers who infest the stylish woods of an already decayed and pulped out postmodernism. Freud paints so slowly that when I see that half-dried-out pot plant, I wonder if it wasn't all green when he started the picture. But the thing that astounds me about this painting is the way that it juggles scale, the way that it juggles position. You would believe that the model was leaning backwards and would recede away from you, but his physical presence is so powerful that he also seems to tower over you. So there's this odd double effect, which is both very natural seeming and at the same time oddly dislocating. And there's a really intriguing kind of contrast that he's brought in between that rather massive and tense set of shapes that make up the body of the man and that sinuous relaxed character of the dog which is just an animal drifting off into unconsciousness. Not far from where Lucian Freud lives in London, there is a riding school. And in that school, one of the horses particularly caught Freud's eye. I mean, Freud has always been fascinated by horses because apart from anything else, he's been a big gambler on the GGs over the years of his life. And this particular horse, he once said to me, had this, it just felt so proud of its own backside. And Lucian thought, well, all right, We'll just paint the horse's ass. We won't bother about its head. Let's just do the backside of the horse. And he did. And I think the result is quite extraordinary with that, to me, amazing observation of the textures and the ripple of muscles under the skin and hair. All that that goes into a painting of what to somebody else might be a rather anonymous kind of equine backside. Every few years, some twit in the art world hops up and sings a song about the death of painting. But what you take away from a show like this one is a triumphant vindication, actually, of painting's liveliness and its rights of claim.
Painting is, you might say, exactly what mass visual media are not. A way of specific engagement, not of general seduction. That is its continuing relevance to us. Everywhere and at all times, there is a world to be reformed by the darting subtlety and persistent slowness of the painter's eye. There is beauty in pure paint confidently handled, and this, of course, does not need just to be figurative. It can be abstract, too. We recognize a Mondrian grid as a defining image of the modern. A Rothko as the work of a man who believed in the spiritual possibilities of blurred fields of color. Or a work by Ellsworth Kelly that creates an art of spare, authoritative and very refined forms. These are images of subtlety and beauty. A beauty which is still accessible to the abstract. And one of the most interesting artists working in abstraction today is Sean Scully. His work is contemplative, painterly. He wants to make art that everyone can understand. He does that by grounding his abstract painting in shared urban experience. Scully's are very New York paintings, yet the Manhattan they evoke is not the foreigner's grid of perfect plains, but rather the heavy, gritty, slapped together look of downtown where Scully has his studio the hoardings of warped plywood, the metal slabs patching the street. No one could take them for super graphics. Their mood is, above all, reflective. They aspire to a rough Doric calm. You have these two polarities that started at the beginning of the 20th century. One is to make art like everything else, and one is to make art different from everything else and, and hold to its position as a kind of sanctuary. And that's the position that I hold to. And I'm trying to make something that's spiritually informed and powerful and so on. And they're opposing points of view. If you make art interactive, you make it like advertising, you make big photographs that look like billboards, etc., etc. They're very striking but at a great cost, I believe, and that is the, the fact that art's in danger then of losing its, its soul, the thing that makes it different and it gives us a place to go to. Scully's work is meditative and strangely confrontational. He wants to give the image the distinctness of a body asserting itself against your gaze. The surfaces seem to store light like stone. They're opaque. You can't see through them or even into them. Besides, the inlaid, locked-in forms of Scully's work prevent the eye from roaming too freely. Stray out of one box and you finish in another, not on a free horizon. Hence the density, the lack of spaces between things, which adds to the painting's gravity. It may look a little like architecture, but it's painting all the way through. The way that a painting seems to work in the culture is very slowly and subliminally. It's almost dormant on the wall. You know, you can walk right by it and you can ignore it. But every time you come back to it, it lights up, it re-engages. But it does this slowly and it does this, as you say, almost subliminally. Yeah. It's a little bit like the way ivy crawls over a building. If you watch it, you can't see anything happening. You go away for six months and it's different. This is not instant art. It takes years of concentration, years of looking and going in and out of fashion, still painting when faced with the twin poisons of either failure or success.
Abstract painting often has to do with time, with depicting a place where time no longer applies, closer perhaps to music. It represents a search for harmony and grace, a place of timelessness and, to use a word which dropped out of fashion some time back, of beauty. A hundred years ago, 75 years ago even, people used to talk about revolution as though it were the model of art. Art was supposed to be revolutionary. Art was going to produce, if you did it right, it was going to produce some kind of social change. I'm not at all sure that that was ever achieved, and if it was, it was almost invisibly so. And today, I think we're left with a more modest, but an equally difficult task for art to do. And that is to be beautiful, to manifest beauty. People need beauty. There's a hunger for it amid the clamor of visual imagery that surrounds us. And so we seek out zones of silence and contemplation, arenas for free thought and unregimented feeling. Museums have supplanted the church as places both of social congress and of civic pride. They are the new cathedrals, and despite the dubious quality of some of the stuff that actually goes in them, or even outside them, there's a growing hunger for the direct experience of art on a museum wall. A world away from the forest of media, work that is unique and obstinate in its individuality, whether it be by an Anselm Kiefer, a Paula Rago, a Lucian Freud, or a David Hockney. We're seeking value, looking for meaning, a place outside ourselves that tells us that there's more to life than our everyday concerns and needs. You could see this in the crowds gathering for Olafo Eliasson's weather project in the middle of the turbine hall of the Tate Modern. Hundreds of monofilament lamps that suppressed all colors except yellow, shedding a gold light through gloomy air thickened by fog machines underneath a mirrored ceiling. People lay on the floor, staring up at themselves reflected in that ceiling, lit by the pale yellow light of their new sun god. The success of the weather project, with its two million visitors, shows that the hunger for new art is as strong as ever. The idea that aesthetic experience provides a transcendent understanding is at the very heart of art. It fulfills a deep human need. And despite the decadence, the confusion and the brouhaha, the desire to experience it, live with it and learn from it remains immortal.